But post-identity does not do away with identity. It allows us, as one critic has said recently, has said recently, to configure identity differently. This is, I suspect, a position most contemporary Australian writers would endorse. And in the case of Brian Castro, it is one he has uh, advocated all along. In Writing Asia, he argues that in Australia, a preoccupation with identity was so virulent in the early 80s that I found my creativity shackled by it. The imposition of a static and enforced identity stifled my creativity for seven years. And you will see that he came back to talking about that in a radio interview he gave last year. Now, while it could be said that his first novel, Birds of Passage, is about the search for identity, as so much of the Asian boom literature has been, there is a crucial difference. To Castro, identity is never something out there or even in here. It is something to be found. Uh, and it is something to be invented. Castro, and I would argue a number of Asian Australian writers who have followed him, <coughs> write their identity into being, often explicitly building this process of identity forming into their work. Birds of Passage remains a paradigmatic text in this regard. The protagonist, Seamus, uh, finds the story of his ancestry behind a mirror reflecting his Asian featured uh, face. And then he writes it literally onto the blank pages of his Australian passport. The story about this identity that he, uh, he, he uncovers is never verified. It is a fiction, a necessary fiction perhaps, but never the less one we can, sorry, say not, say, uh, say that again, but nevertheless it is not one that we can with any certainty regard as the narrative of revelation, truth and origins. We associate with Asian boom writers such as particularly Amy Tan, for example. The question, or rather the problem of identity, has remained central to Castro's work to the present. Ouyang Yu's cultural origins um, are less complex than that of many Asian Australian writers in that he was born and grew up in the People's Republic of China, migrating to Australia as an adult in 1991. However, as you see here, his work repeatedly demonstrates the complexity surrounding categories such as Chinese Australian and Chinese Australian. His poetry traces the uncertain stages of identity formation, often as in this poem he is seeing double, spinning out into a dizzying process of mirroring and multiplication. Okay then, I see that uh, time is passing, so I might skip a little bit, but I want to conclude um, by, um, I want to conclude this admittedly highly selective survey of some Asian Australian writers by commenting on a recently published a book that fits my argument so perfectly that one would think that it had been written to suit the purposes of this paper. In reality, of course, the influence worked the other way around. Tom Cho's Look Who's Morphing, published last year, 19, 2009, takes play with identity to new and often hilarious heights, as in the cover photo, which actually is a photo of the real Tom Cho, but one that has been manipulated, or if you wish, morphed, to evoke popular cult figures like Elvis, Brando, and the fonts from the, sit uh, from the sitcom Happy Days. His manipulation of identity has puzzled his critics. Nicholas Joes, in one review, review referred to Cho's funny, sharp, identity-free writing. The term post-identity has been used in quite a few reviews. But Tom Cho himself insists that his writing is about, quote, the mysterious nature of identity. However, this is identity with a difference, guided by the principle of transformation or morphing. People not only change race and gender, but they morph into their pop culture idols, into animals and cyborgs and robots and cars 
uh, or as in the final story, into a 55 meter tall cock rock god. What would an experience um, that perfectly combines fantasy and a literal look like, asks the Gulliver-like protagonist. The answer is offered in the absurd transformational extremes of each character and story. And yet, there's plenty of method in the madness. Whatever you touch, you become, is one of the guiding principles of morphing, which in turn morphs into whatever you watch you become. The fantasies of popular culture are paraded throughout the stories, ranging from the sound of music, dirty dancing, the Muppet Show, Godzilla, the Exorcist, to Michael Jacqueline, and uh, Michael Jacqueline. <laughs> Sorry about that, Michael. <laughs> Michael Jackson. It was <laughs> be your moment of fame. <laughs> and other pop music cult heroes. These dizzying transformations are, are paralleled by others that seem much more mundane and closer to the author's own experience. Immigrant families, families change their ways and names to adopt uh, to the host country. Asian negotiate, ra Asians negotiate racial, cultural and generational difference with different attitudes and outcomes. Seemingly wild fantasy, fantasies give way to observations that are all too familiar to Asian Australians, such as people saying, not everybody approve of my morphing, or, or the narrator saying, in fact, when I started morphing, some people said that it was a shame that I had become so westernized and that I should do more to retain my culture. Alongside the extravagant morphing fantasies, we glimpse realities of Asian Australia. We also find echoes of the author's personal journey of gender realignment from Natasha Cho to Tom Cho. Um, Cho, who has been explicit about his use of his own life as raw material for his writing, writes, um, have I got that here? No, I haven't. We'll wait on that one then. 